And Gengwa welcome, joined us. Welcome to this second episode of Keeping the Learning On. Keeping the Learning On. And good morning. Patty, that's your cue. I'm sorry. Keeping the learning on. There you go. There we go. I think you can do it, Patty. We got it. And so uh, we had a lovely experience this morning. With we should we should talk about it. We got zoom bombed, uh, and so now we are proceeding with this meeting with us anyway. Oh, we've lost Greg's video. There he is. We don't want to lose you, Greg. I'm back in black. So like today, I came to play with my grandchildren, right? Where'd she go? Yeah. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> this is us. <laughs> now we may just not then, Greg. Yes. <laughs> we look much more professional in the slide, I believe. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so let's today's topic is reveling in the chaos and, and it was a very chaotic start to this. Yes. It was a very chaotic start. Uh, and uh, we're glad that you folks who are watching this later on uh, weren't there yes. because it was quite the experience. Mm. Uh, but we, we were just starting to talk about uh, the world is in lockdown. Your career is not. Neither is a lot of channels, apparently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, so, so, uh, did, you, did you say, like, literally, we got Zoom bombed? You know, you hear about yeah. that in the headlines. We go yeah. live, and all of a sudden, there's dozens of folks uh, expressing their views about pretty much all, everything. And all probably... sorts of things in very graphic language and, yeah, um, mm -hmm. and, yeah and, hopes and, and dreams, all talking about their hopes and dreams. Yeah. And, right. if, we were, if we were all in high school, that would have meant we were popular <laughs> because they cared. They and cared exactly. enough they to cared send the enough. very best. Yes, <laughs> That's exactly. absolutely right. Um, you know, and, so, I, and I think it's quite interesting when you think about, you know, their hopes and dreams. And I wonder what, I wonder what their careers might turn out to be, actually. Well, <laughs> so... So I, I am the eternal optimist. I actually, I, I, I don't think disparagingly on folks like that. So the thing is, this has been a really chaotic week. And I've yeah. noticed kind of a, a change in energy in people. And this is the sure. spot where people want answers. We want to we wanna come to some conclusion. What, what's going to happen? I'm, I'm, I'm tired of holding my breath. I'm tired of sitting here waiting for things to get Hang back on. to normal. I'm just going to Google that and let you know. Right. Okay. Just, <laughs> if you could let me know when normalcy is going to return, that would be great. And I think that's why this quote really jumped out at me. This one that's, you know, right down here. <laughs> then he changes it. Is, you know, we're in lockdown and whatever that means, it, it depends on where you're at or how you're responding to it or what your work is. Uh, some of us uh, have no work whatsoever and in terms of paid work. And some of us have a lot of work because our jobs are to enable people to work remotely. But in a very real sense, there's nothing in lockdown about our careers. And, and, and the whole idea of those that are looking for the opportunity in this chaos, I think are have a leg up or an opportunity to, to, to continue moving forward and not voluntarily shrink back. There's, there's definitely um, uh, the opportunity with uh, newfound time, whether that's time uh, outside of your usually work from home work day, uh, you're still finding a little bit more time to do other things than what you normally would do. I think it's, I think we've been talking for so long, the four of us, about reskilling and upskilling and how important it is with the speed of technology. And uh, one of the things that companies are not necessarily equipped to do at that kind of speed is to have everyone um, understand that the, the, they can't keep up with the career options. Like organizations, training plans just aren't there. Well, yeah. It's really it interesting. I've had, uh, I had a few people reach out to me, um, you know, on a, a coaching mentor side of things and just saying, well, you know, how do I change, um, how do I change what I do now, what I have been doing? How do I now translate that into an online environment or how do I make that real so I can keep doing that stuff? But I've also had people asking me about actually thinking about, you know what? I kind of been 
been thinking about doing consulting for a while or thinking about doing right. coaching mentoring for a while and that's something you can do virtually so some people are trying to think about how they're going to make that transition yeah you had you had put a slide up there roy about there's uh that i had sent you earlier this week there's no such thing as change without pain no growth without discomfort that's why it's impossible to become someone new without first grieving the loss of who you used to be. And when I ran across that one, really, in order to move forward, we need to first acknowledge who, who we were a number of weeks ago and what we want to be. That's that same current future kind of where's the gap? And the gap is always uncomfortable. The gap is always a transitional uh, frustration, I, I guess, of, of yeah. loss and grief, and then I don't know, and then, and I think we're in that period of, there's just not enough information for us to be designing the future state, but that doesn't mean we can't design the future state of our careers, our you know, pers think, take personal ownership. Yeah, I think there's also another facet to that, and I like, a lot of people are attached to their role a lot yeah. of people are yeah. attached to the skill set they have. And in essence, that also becomes who they are. And I, I really want people to understand that is not who you are. Those roles and those skill sets, if you look at your career, whether it's only just beginning or whether you've been in it for a really long time, is that you are at a point, not what do you want to be when you grow up, you know, we always ask that of kids, right? You know, I want to be a pilot or I want to be a nurse or I want to be this or that. It's, it, start asking yourself, who do I want to be when I grow up? Because those are the values and things that can drive you into these other opportunities and drive you into these other areas that are showing themselves now. And mm -hmm. that will then start uh, bringing some light to the types of competencies and skills that you might need to make that happen. So please people don't 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 hold on to the the role that you had or the the particular skill that I had. That's not who you are. Yeah. Or even in that there are some questions that we can ask ourselves like where are the scarcities in the job I have that I could do a step up up. What's what what kind of resources were not in place that maybe we can rethink or um, who could I hire? What kind of person would I hire to get things done in my life in this new normal? And all of those curious questions about, oh. um, you know, how, how to see things different, you know, in the job, how, how can we look at what hasn't been met and say, Hey, we could shift that to meet something different. So it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, we need a whole career change. Well, and I, I, I want to I want to double back and kind of emphasize what I heard Simone say there, uh, and this kind of gets to that uh, your your why sort of thing is who are you? What are your values? What are you trying to do in this world? Um, you know, pursue your passions. You know, you'll never work a day in your life. I mean, we all we've heard those things for a long time, but now we get to practice that, right? And I think in a very real sense, all of us to some degree have a thought about who we want to be, uh, have a desire to be something. And now we're forced to kind of deal with that. Right. And so yeah. I think there's two things. One is envisioning yourself being you in a, in a new context. Like I how do that, I be a personal trainer in an online world? Your yeah. son's doing it. My daughter is doing it. Uh, how do I become a consultant where I don't show up on site and, and show my slide set and, and interact with the people? Uh, how do I be a trainer when there's not that personal interaction? But the other thing I think, Patty, that I think you're uniquely qualified or positioned to talk to is I think for a lot of us, even though we know that, we need to grieve kind of how we've been being ourselves Absolutely. before we can be ourselves in a different context. How do we do that, Patty? There's a wonderful book uh, written by Clay Christensen called How Will You Measure Your Life? It's mm. actually free on uh, Audible right now. And wow. he, he takes you through um, a really fun exercise of how to take a look at that. And I think it, it does, it loans itself, instead of saying, find your passion, find your purpose. You know, yeah, it's more yeah. of what's my purpose in the world? 
uh, who am I with my values, my beliefs, and, and what I do? And I think anyone who wants to grab that, that free audio book um, on Audible uh, through Amazon is good. It's How Will You Measure Your Life by Clay Christensen. He's, um, he's an academic that is uh, fun to follow. Fun to follow. What? Fun to follow. <laughs> Gregory, that's your title, isn't that's, it? I'm fun to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Not as smart as he is, but. <laughs> um, oh, dear. So, um, can I just, uh, oh, yes, we are recording at the moment. I just realized that uh, uh, we're not live. I was going to do a shout out, but uh, that's almost irrelevant at this point, isn't it? <laughs> it is. well, we're live. <laughs> we're live. Yeah. Well, hello. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but um, I, I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of fun, I think, in those curious questions to ask about what can we do or where those niches are. Yeah. And I think yeah. this is a real time where uh, we can explore in this chaos. I mean, this is the whole point. If, we, if we're going to revel in the chaos, I mean, when you, if you see, you know, let, let, let's revel in this, it really means take a hold of it and enjoy it and throw yourself all in. Right. It, right? right. So, and it, it's impossible to, to move to that until you acknowledge what you've lost, right? Yeah. The, the old normal, be willing to accept nothing in the future is going to be the same. This is world changing global difference. Um, yeah. And so for some people, it's going to be much harder hit than for others. Some people were already partway there. Some people were never there. And understanding and acknowledging they haven't lost themselves. Mm. This is the, the world is on lock, is not, uh, the thing that's not on lockdown is your career or your own person. It's, the, it's what you associate yourself with, just as Simone said. So acknowledging that there is going to be uncertainty. It is going to be confusing. It's um, not necessarily uh, uh, a bad thing to say because it's a way of saying goodbye. It's a yes. way of saying goodbye to what was, but there isn't a lot of information coming about what the world is going to look like, but we can begin to imagine it, I think. So there's there's something on this slide, and by the way, um, if, you're, if you're tuning in later, um, uh, Please, do, please go and download this infographic. We're going to make it available. It's a, it's a really good thing. Could you go back one more, Roy, back to the first point? Patty puts in here that you need to ask for help from someone who is positive, one, and will listen and not be the, the solution to your problem. In other words, I don't call up Patty and I say, Patty, I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. That would be poor of me and, and, and probably poor of her to, uh, to answer that question. Uh, but it also, a, a lot of us, our support, believe it or not, to other people. People yeah. are looking out and you don't know that they're holding on to you or your words or something that you say or do. And so I think it would be really good um, for, for us as individuals, as leaders in our organizations and what we do um, to be positive, but also listen to people listen to people what what they're processing and what they're going through and maybe getting them to the point where they can start envisioning possibilities because i think it would be really easy like like i could say to simone simone you're a rock star you need to start online training and da 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 da, da, da. it's like i've got your life figured out hey you're the one with the guitar not me yeah, I, I got a guitar <laughs> over here <laughs> that i'm not going to play today or, uh, on live here um but i mean that I, I, I think there's some guidance for, for leadership and, and, and individuals in this time. Because it's, it's, for me, it's, it's really easy to look at other folks and, and envisioning them being incredibly successful because I tend towards people's strengths. But they don't need me to tell them. They need, to, they need me to listen to them and hear sure. their concerns. And sometimes yeah. challenge uh, through question. There's some appreciative inquiry needed, you know, as a leader to be able to ask, why do you believe that? Why is that? How can, you know, what do you think? Very open-ended. It very needs open -ended. to be open-ended. And part of that too is that um, we, we're a sounding board in this particular point. We, yeah. we don't have all the answers ourselves. No, nobody has done some of what we're trying to do now. Not everybody has done this. And, <laughs> and most of us are trying to find our way, even ourselves, so as leaders. So when they come to us and ask the same question, we're going to go, you know what? That's a really interesting question. Yeah. 
and and then you just start having the conversation and not trying to solve things it's like it's like being a mirror in a way, isn't it? It's just reflecting back to them so that they have a sense of what did that sound like? Oh, that didn't sound like a bad idea at all, you know, and really then giving them that encouragement and motivation to try out some new things and see how it pans out. And to me, when I hear the term revel in chaos, that is exactly (laughs) what I'm thinking is it's a chaotic situation and me personally or us as individuals we might tend to shrink back until we understand the chaos or that the chaos turns into something that's more complex or complicated or simple i.e going back the cinefin uh kinevin uh framework all the way back to simple which we all want i think um but but the uh the idea is to take some action just Take advantage of the opportunity, try something, yeah. do something, reach out to somebody, connect in a way that you wouldn't. Yeah. Don't let your fears put fences around you that don't exist. Don't yeah. let your, your, your framework of what's past continue to frame you going forward into something that's very new. Exactly. And that was exactly right. my point about not being the role or not being the skill. You were still yeah. you. And I think yeah. this is also a time of discovering who you are. Mm. I think this is also revealing. So it's not very often that we get huge defining moments in our life. And and those defining moments, I I would call that a strategic inflection point. This is this is where we're we're plugging along and we're taking on a nets for companies and individuals and so many others. And we have been using and talking about for the last four years the, a number of different disruptors that have happened in the past that have shook up industries, and mm-hmm. that was their strategic inflection point, right? It was yep. their company's competitive position completely changed. And when a competitive com- position completely changes, we have a couple of ways we can go. On that path, we can, we can continue where we are, and that isn't going to get us anywhere. That's where the, that's where the cliff falls off. That's, yeah. you know, we have to respond to a strategic inflection point. So the next, the next thought was, you know, how do you keep positive? How do you remain positive and something like that? Well, the, it's going to take a couple of things. We have to, as individuals, think about um, flipping our mindset a little bit to exponential thinking. We have to really flip our mindset to understand that there is a, there is growth, especially in extreme scenarios, Mm. right? So reframing to the positive is, is really important. Um, And to understand that that the difference between uh, complicated, which was the life you were living before and complex, which is the life we're living right now. Yeah. So the complexity of what we've moved into has increased. It's not just a lot of moving parts in our life right now. It's like we've, um, we've gone from predictable to unpredictable. And the complexity has increased with so many unknowns, right? Mm. Yeah. So while you were doing that, uh, we advanced to the reframing to the positive. And I'm yeah. reminded of the summer um, so I, I had the, the, the honor of working for a fortune 10 company for the first 25 years of my career. And my whole existence was around that company and what I did in that organization. And so when I was abruptly put in the, uh, pool of folks that wouldn't be continuing with the organization from downsizing, et cetera, uh, I spent the summer essentially doing this, uh, reframing the positive, uh, and I did it because I didn't know what to do. I didn't do it because I was so smart or because I had a, a grand plan. I just didn't know what to do. And so I started writing things down and I started trying to find how does that become a positive? Um, and uh, pity parties is a tough, tough phrase, Patty, uh, because most of us don't like to say, I, I think I'm having a pity party. Um, we want to say, no, this is a reasonable response to the situation that I'm in. Don't tell me it's a pity party. It's not a pity party. And yet, that's exactly what it is. Um, and then accept reality and start moving forward. I think this is brilliant. Um, but I think the people we hang out with 
um, defines whether we're in a pity party or not, right? If it, the people we choose to have the conversations with, how we work that through, right? Um, so, <laughs> and, and you so thank you for a, letting me. Go ahead. You cannot be in a pity party with Patty. No, you can't. <laughs> then it would be pity party Patty, and that would be no good at all. Thank you. I fulfilled my function for the day. I'm going back on mute now. Uh, um, Roy, I understand that there may be a couple of people on the private link in the waiting room, so I'm not sure if um, uh, or needs to be accepted in some way into uh, the thing. I just thought I'd highlight mm, that. Do not see silver linings. Silver but, linings. Uh, yeah, silver linings. Well, that's the whole thing, isn't it? It's like. We mentioned that in the first episode too, that there is a, a time of grieving. Yes. And we have to acknowledge that emotion. I think that's important, mm -hmm. but to stay in it for too long a period, uh, not only brings yourself down, but it brings everyone else around you down. So, so, so here's my challenge uh, to anybody that's listening and to any of us that are on the phone, reach out to somebody and yeah, say, exactly. let's do something. Yeah. Whatever. Let's exactly. let's write a let's write an article. Let's talk for thirty minutes about some topic. Let's do something. Find an, a thing that reframes that gets you in a positive space. Because I I feel like there's kind of a, a, a priming of the pump, so to speak. Is if if yeah. you if you're stuck in that kind of you know my my cheese has moved, my world has collapsed. I don't know what to do. I'm not relevant anymore. That's kind of. Uh, uh, a death spiral it's kind of a, a really really negative spot so if we do something especially something new that we haven't done before or with a different uh, group of people there's a positivity in that we all like positive uh changes we're going to a party on friday night we're going to go to on vacation somewhere we all like these positive things moving forward sorry patty go ahead no that's okay it's but it's how the brain works right that's yeah. that's neuroscience yeah. in in a nutshell is basically where you put your thoughts where you put your attention mm. where you put your focus is what you're going to see so if you were to if you were to look at a, a particular object and stare at it everything around that object becomes out of focus Mm. And that object appears in your mind's eye to grow a little bit larger. But if you begin looking around, the object suddenly becomes smaller and becomes a different size because now you're focusing on something else. So that which we focus on, we intensify. If you want to reduce stress, it's focusing on those silver linings. It's fo focusing on the action, right? So I find it uh, uh, interesting that every one of this panel uh, has a, a an artistic um, side to us. <laughs> Patty, in the background, you have a painting and you've been working on those lately. Simone, I won't even try to express all the artistic endeavors. Simone has this whole second life that most of us IT people didn't know about where she's incredibly creative, both in her writing and expression and, and depth. And, and, and Roy has, has done a lot in performing arts and, and is incredibly uh, gifted in, in, in connecting with people on that way. He's I'll leaning forward. some like, interpretive dance later. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Hang and, on. And you're going and you're going <laughs> to mute my phone uh, when I get to that. Um, and, and, I've, and I've been working. I have a point. I'm not just talking. I have a point. Uh, it, when you talked about that, uh, Patty, I was thinking about, I've been using some of my time to rekindle a, a passion that I've had in photography. And one of the things that the professional photographers talk about is that perspective or how do you pull out the object or how do you draw the eyes to the piece of the picture that you want to see? There's a great photo that I, I won't be able to um, uh, pull up here on demand, but it's of a busy street in India. And I look at it and I just experienced it. And then the professional photographer who took it explained what the photo did. And then I realized that I had done, my eyes went where uh, he or she said that I was supposed to. And, and so the idea as, a, as a, an, as an expressive or, or a, a, a creative person is, how do we focus our attention on those things that matter? And I, and I apply that to my work and, and the, the things that I try to do. And you know, sometimes the background noise really gets loud to me. Hey, we've been joined by Suresh. Hey! Hey. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Here is our global BRM award winner. I'm just being quiet enough. I didn't want to spoil the sport. I was like kind of 
what happened? I think that's one of the problems when you open it up publicly, yeah. people just grab it across. But that's a lesson learned, I think. Uh, yes. Yeah. It is, oh, yes. but um, just to catch you up, Suresh, so we've actually been talking uh, specifically about reveling in the chaos and Correct. that it doesn't mean, although we're in lockdown, it doesn't mean your career is in lockdown. Sure. And uh, so we've been going through Patty's great little lessons in this. Sure. Um, I'll be a silent observer just looking out what the pearls of wisdom is going to unravel. So I'm going yeah. to be the Nice to meet you, it, Greg. Roy. It is really good to see you, Suresh. I haven't seen you live in a couple of years, but I, I, I'm watching what you're doing and you're out changing the world. And I will tell you that <laughs> when you go back and look at the recording of when you joined, that's exactly it, is, is there's new possibilities out there. The world has not shut down in a opportunity sense. It's only shut down in a kind of a physical sort and of sense. And you sense. should see him on a dance floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing it again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've walked through a couple of phases of, of how do we build personal, you know, how do you revel in the chaos? And we talked about just acknowledging the emotions, right? The loss, the, the fear, the things that, that uh, um, big changes elicit in all of us, um, and then reframing to the positive. And I think we're kind of working toward... Um, how to believe and see the bigger picture. Um, the, Simone, before we started, we were, when we were talking among ourselves, we talked about find reasons to believe. And um, you had said, man, that's, that's a tough one. That's a tough yeah. one to find reasons to believe when we don't have information. We don't exactly. know where this is going. We don't know what the future looks like when they're, especially for so many whose businesses are so amazingly, difficultly um, impacted. Uh, I, think, I think one of the things is what we were just talking about, is that which we focus on, we intensify. If we, if we dig into Twitter and look at all the news and comments, if we pay attention to too much news, if we're if we're absorbing ourselves in all of the, I need another update, I need another update, oh my God, I need another update. And then the oh my gods get so much bigger and so it's really hard to reframe, it's really hard to find reasons to believe. Hope lives in muting the noise, mm. right? Oh, oh, that is such a brilliant That's going out on Twitter in about use. half an hour. Oh, oh. <laughs> But that is. Hour, it's, it's like it's already out in the ether. The, the <laughs> white noise that is in our lives, that the signals that we're looking for to help us open up what we're trying to do. Um, you know, actually, Suresh, I know that you, you've become quite a master at, at getting through that white noise and laser focus yeah. on what one needs to do with their career and how they need to shift it and move it into even directions that you weren't expecting. Yeah. Uh, you, you can unmute now. <laughs> yes. So I was just telling that I think um, uh, everybody needs a reset button. Uh, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a conscious decision around the noise to uh, reflect upon where am I truly heading to and what am I supposed to do? Um, and I think um, this goes with the Zen story of um, maintaining that balance um, and focusing on daily rituals. So one of the daily rituals is about having that perfect solitude to be with your senses to look at what the heck is happening around me and then figuring it out. Is there something that I need to look out from a, from a, from a different pair of lens? So I think I, I love that he's talking. I don't want to kind of, and with the flow and party is going, I'm just trying to be absorbed, self-absorbed because I'm just trying to go into that Zen part of listening to that wisdom because I think there is absolutely so much noise. So we need to kind of look at that time to smell the roses and stuff like that. I, I love this period of reset. So that's why I was quite keen to just be a part of it to listening more. I was not part of you know, planning something to tell, but uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to this discussion. I, on the other I, hand, am the noise. So <laughs> I'm trying to be. It depends on which voice you do it in. Trying to be so, quiet. So, so, so let's talk about some practical things um, from, from all of us is how do we turn out the, in a practical sense, when, when this video pro podcast is over, 
how do I turn the noise down? What are things that I can do? Anybody listening to this, how do I turn the noise down so that I can start finding what other pieces are important um, or, or, or may have opportunity for me? Anybody? One of the things we have to learn how to do, and it takes a certain amount of, it takes a lot of self-discipline. Okay. Yeah. It's to flip through things on social media or the news or whatever, but keep flipping when you see, uh, you know, something that might otherwise make you angry or sad or out, feel out of control. Keep going, bypass it, go to something that interests you, draws your attention and makes you think. I've gone. I've gotten into a habit of of searching the hashtag good human story mm. and starting my day with good human stories. And there's a lot of them out there. And uh, you know, finding finding either the hashtag or the or the um, uh, environment or the community uh, online community that is full of positivity. There's a community called the Humans First Club that mm -hmm. um, I've been spending some time with. There's Lots of different options that allow us the opportunity to to really get rid of the noise that is tapping into the negative emotions. The negative emotions create those negative thought processes that do that whole neuroscience thing that we were talking about earlier, where that which we focus on we intensify. Um, and then remembering, you know, when we when we talk about finding reasons to believe, every ending is a new beginning. Exactly. And I Reason to believe, by the way. Reason yeah, to Believe is a wonderful old Tim Harden song, and you should go and find it and listen to it. It's a wonderful song. I, th I think you Reason should put to that believe. in there, Roy. I don't know if when anybody watches this recording back, you'll notice that I had my mute on and I was, and Greg was laughing like <laughs> crazy. But it was funny when, when you were talking about what are the practical things that we can do? Mm -hmm. That was just a physical demonstration. We need to mute ourselves sometimes. Ah. Nicely done. Nicely done. I like that. I, th I you know, point taken. I, I'll do that. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, One of the things that's worked for me and uh, probably my two senses, uh, taking a nature's walk has helped me mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I take away my watch as well as my mobile phone and I'm absolutely some of, someone who could not be reached. For the 30 minutes every day, I make a ritual between 12.30 to 1 o'clock that nobody can reach me in any part of the world. So I go there with, with that kind of stroll walk to really look at what am I doing as part of being and existing in this whole world? Because there's so much dimensions behind your career, your personal growth and stuff like that. I just want to go away and say, I'm, I'm, I'm a speck in the whole universe, like Mark, Mark Swally says, right? And I'm yeah. a speck on that, right? Yeah. And it gives you that level of groundedness and then says, you know what? I think it's too much that you're running across. Let's slow down a bit. So that's my slow down period to look at what is happening around. And it has actually made me focus on things that really matter the most. Mm. Um, and, and it has helped me to uh, break the, the, the flow in a way to do that. And I've also loved that siesta, the short nap that I've done in the afternoons, which I think it for definitely I'm so busy am I, I will take the nap because that's my luxury of going back to that uh, state of uh, alpha state. So I would say See, a now couple of a, That's an interesting thing because in Europe, we've always had siesta, right? There, there's always been the long lunch. So, you know, in France, it's like between 12 and 2, that mm -hmm. period of time, absolutely sacred. That is for having your lunch, for whether you just want to read your book, go for a walk, it's to recharge because they've mm -hmm. already been working quite a number of like very tough hours sometimes for them. Uh, or so it's not so much the length of time, it's the amount of energy and effort that's put into that morning session, if you like, before they have the lunch. Now, a lot of people say, oh, a two hour lunch, wish I could do that. You can do that because what they do is they work productivity level mm -hmm. they work productivity time not time right. time right we, so we I touched on that last last time right we talked yeah. about that and activity versus productivity and and the problem is that we all you know the spider has eight legs and tends to build a web that has eight branches uh they see things in fours and eights four eyes eight legs 
we see things from our own perspective and we have to realize that although there is a, a high percentage of service work and knowledge work now, that an awful lot of people do not have the option to take more than a 30 minute lunch, do not have the option to take advantage of, of interconnectedness the way we are. And, okay. and I think that, that we have to be mindful of that and remember that the, so the same principles apply, but oh. the way that people can be resilient, it may be entirely different. Exactly. And, yeah. I, I think the point is that we, um, and that I'm hearing from everyone is really that we need to become purposefully intentional. And so something I did about six months ago was I turned off all my notifications. <laughs> I have no notifications on my phone, none. I have no notifications anywhere so that I can be purposefully intentional on how I spend my time and when I respond. Mm -hmm. And that has given me, uh, and that little tiny change, that's all it took was this little tiny change, right? And it, it changed my world. Mm -hmm. I am not constantly feeling like I have to respond. Now you can't do that at a service desk. Let me just be clear. <laughs> but- uh, hang, on, hang on, Patty, I'll get back to you in a second here. Yeah. But purposeful right. intentionality you of your time and your space is Did you really get that email I sent you, Simone? Yeah, Sorry, I, I just saw that. Either. You know, we're just, no, I'm gonna just get that WhatsApp thing uh, fixed. If I could say, uh, what you were saying, Patty, I'm so sorry. <laughs> there was something oh, I tweeted yesterday that uh, I'm just gonna go back and, and look at, and, and, so naughty, and I, right? I, I don't think anybody got it, frankly. Um, but I said, uh, in quotes, did you send that email? Did you send that message in email? Yes. Yeah. Did you put it in Teams? Yes. Slack? Yes. Yammer? Yes. Facebook group? Yes. LinkedIn group? Yes. Did you send the SMS? Yes. What have you missed? Um, letting people work. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and this is, I, I, I don't know who to blame. So uh, let's, 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 we'll blame Roy. But there's there's something that, and we're all aware of it is technology has changed the culture it has for 20 years at least 20 years and there was a a culture around the dot com the startup the you do everything to be successful that made us really very very tied to our technology and always connected and the idea that we would wake up and interrupt a meeting because it was all happening right here and right now that era has passed and, and we've recognized that human beings do not function like that. The go, go, a go, go has yeah. gone. Yeah, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and I think that there's, there's, if you combine that culture of technology along with Roy disagrees with me, so I'm going <laughs> to hang on. There's, there's a combining of that along with some very Neanderthal management that is like, look, if you're, if you don't respond within so many minutes, then you're not being productive. I'm pretty sure that you're being lazy at home and, that is a, a culture that it, we haven't yet parted ways with, and it's come f uh, fast forward into this modern era. Roy. I, I yeah. think that, that there, there's a problem uh, with the push over the last several years. Collaborate, 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 collaborate. Um, no, stop. Back off. We've discovered now, apparently, which many of us already knew, that the open office idea did not work, does not yeah. work, no, and should not should be should have been shot a long time ago. Um, I was working in open offices back in, in the 1970s, and it didn't work then, and it doesn't work now. Uh, so we now that our tech pit. Yeah, but but as I I mentioned, uh, you know. I, during my why we work day, I've got Slack, Teams. Uh, we get messages from Yammer, Chatter, email. I, my entire day is interrupt driven, and uh, there are times when it really is overwhelming. And I, and I think that that that's true of an awful lot of people. But we're still adding tools that are like that. We're adding tools, and even in our, you know, even in the IT service management world, mm -hmm. the tools that are are now much more social. They're like Facebook. 
yeah. they're not where you know there were discrete tickets and were assigned to a particular person. It's much more social, and so everything is interrupt driven. This is not a good way to produce things, and I think we're going to find that out really quick. I, I, I'm not sure if we can say it's not a good way to produce things. I think how we're managing around them is a problem. I think that we are still stuck on uh, attendance equals performance. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that we are failing to understand the, uh, the human impact of an SLA. <laughs> I think that how we are responding to our ability to have the technology as opposed to purposeful use of the technology and the number of technologies we are layering within our organizations that have dual purpose. Uh, so I think the shift that needs to happen is that, that real understanding um, of the importance that IT plays in managing the business and really putting some focus into what does that mean for our people? So well, I think I was going to say, I think that comes back to your resilience through chaos. Mm -hmm. We talk about reframing to the positive. There's something very much around that, not just for the individual resilience, but organizational resilience as well. Mm -hmm. I think they need to reframe the way they view uh, their, the, uh, their business model. I think the business models are starting to shift and not just because of the other frameworks, um, you know, that are existing, you know, with businesses wanting to become more agile, etc. But there is a, a reframing of uh, not just structurally, but culturally starting to happen. Can I, can I quickly before you, Greg, <laughs> jump in? <laughs> I have, so, so, for the last three years, the talks I've been doing uh, when I go out and speak, and the book I'm publishing this year is talks about the three holdbacks, and we've mentioned it in a few articles that Roy and I have, have uh, both uh, contributed on, and that is we have a 1950s organizational structure. Yep. We have a 1970s management style, we yep. have a 1980s shareholder focus. Mm -hmm. And we're asking everyone under those horribly limiting constraints to innovate, mm -hmm. to, uh, to be more creative, to be disruptors, to, and, and the actual supports, the foundational supports. We don't fund projects to, to experiment. We don't, uh, have an organization that is set up with a uh, cross-functional understanding of authority where actual decisions can be made at the level they the need. The models to. are no longer they working. They no yeah. longer work. They're no longer working. And now we've had this amazing um, inflection point of what's going on at this moment. And we have some really, really big organizational decisions to make yep. in order to support the new normal. Yep. So something that, that I've been really kind of thinking through related to all of this, uh, and, and I'm going to put it out there to the world because I'm, I'm kind of working on it, but it's, it's, it's very emerging right now. And the idea is that you talked about the organizational structures and the mindset and some of the culture. And it occurred to me as I'm trying to, in, in, and, and you know, I've moved out of my CIO role into operating more strategically within my organization. But as a CIO, I was building a relationship with the chief human resources officer. And the reason for that is technology impacts culture or intersects with culture and culture intersects with technology. And he can't Absolutely. say we need a new culture because yeah. the culture has to be, uh, has to is influenced by technology and so uh here it is i'm putting it on record i'm looking at a model that in the same way that we took dev and ops and created this new way to think dev ops uh in a service delivery model i'm thinking of it is no longer as a silo or as a department and hr no longer as a silo or a department interacting in a way that they never have before and blurring some of the lines and perhaps even changing the very role there uh, is actually a lot of talk around that in the industry as i think you might you know you're aware oh yeah 
about how, um, you know, does, uh, do the departments actually exist as departments anymore? Yeah. Uh, is there truly going to be a finance department, sales department, HR and high tier, et cetera? Um, this silo mentality that we've been struggling with all the years. But it's interesting because there's a combination of people wanting some stability and understanding where they fit and how they belong. But there's also... Uh, looking at it from the different perspective where uh, the roles are blending now. That, and that's They're where I'm going blending. is. Absolutely. Yeah. So there, there was an article in, uh, in uh, CIO.com from uh, Stacy Collette, I'm, and I'm trying to quickly get to it as well. The next digital disruption, the role of the CIO. And in that they talk about, uh, the author talks about the different roles that the CIO is expected to play. And, and the list is exhaustive. And in, 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 the, in the writer, actually, and we can put the link in there later, I guess, but um, the writer goes on to suggest that none of these new roles, a traditional CIO had to perform. It wasn't about that. And yeah. so now all of a sudden, you really have this kind of the superhero expectations of a CIO that you're going to be an expert at cultural transformation, at digital transformation, and, and, and all of these other things that we haven't traditionally done. And I think that it's a formula for failure. I mean, there are some outstanding CIOs out there. And I've, I've met some. Uh, I, I, you I, were one. I... <laughs> <laughs> um, I would rather give credit to, to folks that I know because there's, um, I, I'm, I, I, I won't name names, uh, but there's, there's some people out there that are responsible for some rather large organizations and do th some great things. But this is a model that's been strained and strained and strained to the point where even those that are really, really gifted aren't going to be able to do it anymore. And so what do you do? And, and, and we know that we have chief uh, transformation officers and chief, chief data officers, and we have these new roles emerging, and we haven't figured out how they all fit together. And yeah. I think it's time for us to quit thinking of this is the IT and this is the business and this is, you know, the, the other departments. Um, I agree. One of the things that I think that, um, that has emerged out of the entrepreneurship is in a small uh, startup company, there, there aren't departments, there, there aren't roles. I mean, I'm IT and the person sitting next to me is HR, right? We're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And the, the formality of the relationship is very, very different than in a big organization where you have a uh, hundred or a thousand uh, or, or 10,000 IT people globally. That's very, very different than a startup. But the culture is, 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 uh, is requiring us to change and the speed and precision with which we have to operate doesn't work in the current existing structure. And we need to rethink that. Yes, absolutely. So that brings us to uh, an interesting uh, point here, I think, because one of the things that we stumbled over the last time we talked was uh, we had thought about the next episode after today. And the phrase that we, we talked about was the edge of something new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I really like that. And I think that that's where we are. And, and Greg, as you were saying, you know, these roles are evolving uh, so fast. We, we don't even know what the expertise is now for a particular role. So we're defining right. these new roles because we, we don't know. And tomorrow that, you know, everything's going to change. And I think, so I think though that we can, we can start by uh, recognizing and starting to see patterns, right? We can see, we can recognize and start to see patterns, patterns of pain, mm. <laughs> as well as patterns of, of growth and technology. What is accelerating and why? And what is the experiential piece behind that that is making it accelerate? What are humans wanting? What are people wanting? What are we uh, choosing to gravitate toward in the environment? And I think, I think because of the last, you know, number of years that we've all been speaking about this together among ourselves, we have this, uh, this opportunity to take a look at different views. We, we know there are a couple of big players out there that are doing some things right. You know, the continuous improvement models that we see out there that don't have IT as a cost center, but as an enabler. We, uh, we know that those patterns for successful people who are moving forward are emerging quite well. Um, and those, those people who are fighting so hard 
to not be mm -hmm. disrupted because they don't want anything to change are the ones we have to look at very carefully and why are they? I mean, cable, cable networks come to mind when I think of that. Um, uh, and, and internet providers, you know, they're, they're trying to hang on to something and the world just exploded underneath them. And now well, they see, have that's new... where I think when we were talking earlier, this, the whole point of saying revel in the chaos is coming back to that curiosity question again, mm -hmm. isn't it? Exactly what yeah. you're talking about is where is the wonder, you know, it's a, if, when I think about what were the possibilities when I was little and looking out in this big space and going, wow, check this out. Um, <laughs> and never really knowing where it might go. Uh, you know, I thought about being lots of different things when I was a child growing up. What are all the different possibilities? And we're actually quite lucky. I think if we could once again come back to that sense of wonder, it could actually bring us that little bit of joy in hmm. being able to actually step to the edge because hey I'm a, I'm a I, I can't do heights very well at all right so if I want to step to that edge and that edge for me is can be quite scary yet when I, I look back and think how many times have I changed my career I've, I've you know it's not like we haven't done it I have, a can, I have a can called coffee break and every day I pull something out and yesterday I pulled one out and I just want to read it to you you don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so I was just telling Can that I have I the was banister, though. <laughs> uh, the way we had, and, and uh, Greg brings a great point. Now, hierarchical way of organizations have now moved towards network based organization. So you look at the whole thing, like um, there was an interview done with, uh, with uh, Steve Jobs. He says that, do you know how many committees do we have in Apple? He said zero. That's how we operate. So typically the whole model, the, the business model is evolving in the way of network structure. So which means yes. you might not have the, have the great expertise, but you can bring in another expert from outside and build a small satellite. And there's a good representation of satellites, the, the sun, the planets around, we have moon and all of those stuff, which means you're not confined on the rigid arc structure that we had for years and years for centuries, but you're trying to look at more like a, uh, a, a small network where we can kind of conglomerate for a purpose. You call it as squads, you call it as autonomous teams to get delivered and move on. So you're not kind of, you, you're kind of being more adaptable to the situation it demands rather than just being rigid about this is my org structure and stuff like that. So you can still have your t shaped profiles built across as we start to move on. But the ability that you don't have a permanent home makes you on the toes. In my opinion, that's the way that we'll all have to evolve as we move on from the current ways of thinking to the future digital models. And that's exciting times. If that you're not exciting. going to do that, you're not going to, you're not going to sustain. You know, you know, the example you used of satellites like that, or the, the planetary, you know, looking at the universal system, uh, being from a network, it is a network, if you like. But one of my favorite movies is Mission to Mars. Uh, not just because Gary Sinise is in it, but, mm. <laughs> but one of the things that was said in that movie that I find really fascinating, and it does bring us uh, to why we're thinking about our third episode, um, you know, <laughs> being on the edge of something new, is in that movie, um, it was said that to stand on the edge of that planet and being able to look towards to the next. Yeah. And that for me, the visual of that is really powerful that we did it, you know, they did it back when they said, well, when do we put a man on the moon? They stood on the edge yeah. and they looked to the next. And if you can stand on that edge and look to the next, then you, you're, you're moving forward. Yeah. You're, you're propelling the rest. And if you've got a nice wake, <laughs> maybe we can bring a few other people along with us, huh? So, that's, where, so, so. that's where see the big picture fits in, right? That next, yeah. that next one on those slides was, um, number one, the situation is not your future. Mm. You know, you have to separate yourself. The situation is the situation. Um, it's temporary. And difficulties turn into opportunity if you can look for them. You have to see that bigger picture. So um, you just led right into that, Simone, so, so well. It's beautiful. Um, we have to break and bust our old patterns. 
Um, one that comes to mind is performance reviews. Oh. <laughs> uh, I would love to see it, right? I'd love to just, I'd just love to trash those so that we look at interdisciplinary as opposed to hierarchical uh, ways, of, uh, ways of functioning. Um, and then creating a new story for your life. You know, when I talked about how will you measure your life? Well, that's, that's let's create a new story for your life. Um, you have that power. And, and a lot of us feel like we get stuck in the situation and we hand that power away. I mean, take you know, it back. It's, it's a new chapter. That's it's what's a, happening right now. It's yeah. a new chapter. And we have that, uh, whatever it is that you control, this is, this is you. And you, you can pick up on that pen and, we don't necessarily know what the ending is yet, but if we can enjoy the journey somewhat and the things that, and even in the chaos itself, there is some crap that happens to us. We know that there is some really bad, but that's part of that story. It's what makes you a whole person. It's what helps mm -hmm. uh, build your value systems. It's what helps build your beliefs and understanding about who you are in the world around you and how you interact within that space and also not how you react just within it but how you cause reactions within it and i think that's the other thing that we need to remember that we're also actually helping move things along we're also part of that instigator if you like so suresh so brought up um the the steve jobs interview which I, i'm actually not familiar with his words there but i did a keynote in new zealand in 18 2018 uh, and I talked about emergent teaming, and 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 it's based on uh, some good research from uh, Amy Edmondson, Dr. Amy Edmondson out of Harvard University, and she talks about that this the skills that we need going forward are very human in nature. In other words, it's not I'm a network engineer, and so if you need a network engineer, call me. It's a we need a team of people to solve this problem. And I talked about, remember when the, the soccer team was, was, was stuck in a cave or the Chilean miners were stuck uh, down below and they formed these teams of international experts who had no idea. This is a new problem that we hadn't seen before and they got together and they solved the problem. And the really interesting part about um, the, in the case of the Chilean miners, I think this is fascinating because they solved the problem and every single one of them came out um, relatively unscathed. It was, it was phenomenal. You know, uh, United States yeah. NASA got involved and engineers from all around the world, including locals that understood the geog geology of the, of the situation. And nobody discussed intellectual property or who owns the blah, blah, blah. But that started almost immediately after they were solved is this rescue pod, pod who owns it? Whose IP is this? Who gets to market, uh, capitalize on this in the marketplace? And in a corporate culture or in, in, a, in, a, in a business culture, my, my view is that we rapidly assemble teams to solve problems that didn't exist before. And when there's a clear and present, this is the outcome that we need to produce. And there's no rules. There's no, uh, you know, there's no segmentation or silos. It's just get smart people together to solve problems. And as individuals in a workplace, I think increasingly we need to think of ourselves as somebody who can get together with a group of people, rapidly coalesce, and, 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 and transcend culture and language and other barriers so that we get to the, to the job at hand and be successful at that. And this the skills the needed... Role. This Say is again? the new leadership role. That is the new leadership this role. Is, this is the new leadership role. This is the, the, those that are actually going to bring on... Uh, these teams um, and not from a managerial perspective necessarily, you know, there's always going to be administrative things that need to Absolutely. be taken care of, right? You know, we need to get paid. We have to, you know, talk about health cover and all those sorts of things. Yes, that still needs to be there. But in this, in this perspective, our leaders, some of them don't know how to shift yet. No. So we're also having to look at new competencies and new ways for them to act in the, this space and behave not just right. respond, but absolutely to actually and behave in the I manner. also th I also think that one of the, one of the things that maybe is going to come out of this is and I think it happened to our parents or grandparents or whoever 
through the Great Depression or, or you know, one of the big wars, or whatever it happened to be, some huge occasion that involved everybody uh, like this current situation does, is that it, it makes people stop and back up and say, what, what am I working on that's important? Is mm -hmm. this important? What am I doing? Am mm -hmm. I, you know, is producing this razor, which is like every other razor on the planet, is that important? Is that going to change anybody's life? Is this, and of course, we've heard a lot of that type of question from younger folks recently. Mm -hmm. Greg, you talked about it last time. And I think that we're all in that situation now. And I think that that's one of the things that we really have to think about is how we organize not only the leadership, not only the workforce, but also our industries. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Is this of any importance to anybody other than us getting a paycheck? And right. I think that that's going to be critical going forward as well. We are in the greatest technological experiment global experiment <laughs> that we have ever been in. It How Greg should be able to solve way, this. He is right? a great experiment in and of himself. <laughs> <laughs> but really, when you think about it, how we collect and observe the data, mm -hmm. the experiences, what, what is going on around us is going to be key to us being successful of, from this inflection point, right? It's this is the most powerful and the greatest experiment we have been in ever that is proving technology can launch us. AR VR has moved 10 years in two weeks mm -hmm. um, because people were like, yeah, that's never going to go mainstream. That's never going to go mainstream. And now every single, every single large organization that does events is looking at AR VR. Yeah. We are, um, the exponential moves that we've been talking for the last year together as a group and, mm -hmm. and saying it's coming, it's coming, it just landed in our lap, except as an experiment. You know, sometimes, I don't know about you guys, but there's, <laughs> there's a bit of a Cassandra moment I'm feeling. <laughs> You know that we're, we have been talking a lot about this is just going to hit and one day some of these organizations are going to crash and burn because they are not preparing themselves uh, for what is actually coming and or and that day say, is next it week is coming that, that day is next week um, so I, I feel a little bit like uh, they say yeah 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 we hear you but we're not really listening well, and I, and I think that's, that's really what we're dealing with here is it's no longer yeah. a technology issue. Patty is absolutely right. Is, mm. is it happened. It changed overnight. Yep. But there's going to be this whole continuum of people who we're already there. We've been doing this for five years and people over here that I was like, uh, don't change my world. Right. And so there's a continuum of human response to the new reality. Here's what I think. We have, uh, and, and, I, and I started to make this point last time we got together, is we have this opportunity where, let's say forward-looking, it's, it's not an, a generational thing or an age thing, but forward-looking people are just like, let's go, let's do this, right? And they start companies, they start relationships, they build partnerships, and they move quickly to do something. While large organizations are still going, well, let's charter a project and the IT folks can kind of commission a study and blah, blah, blah. All of this traditional stuff. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But the rate of change required, we can't, we can't sustain that kind of institutional uh, lethargy anymore. Is We have to move at a rate that we never have before to, to leverage the reality. Here's the, the key is we can't move that fast carrying the baggage of organizations and structure yeah. and all those things. We it's have to let the baggage down. go. And so that we can move very, very quickly. And that's, I think the challenge that, that organizations face right now. Okay. Well, I'll, 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 well, go ahead. Sorry, I'll, I'll just give one, one more of my time. I just want to make it very simple. The focus has to move towards purpose. Now I go with two things. Look at the golden circle of the Simon Sinek where you talk about the purpose. Because when you're when you're very you have that clarity of purpose, it doesn't it will break barriers and you'll make it happen. The last thing that I got inspired by reading a book was Ikigai. What is your Ikigai? Going back to the part of 
what's your sweet spot about the purpose? Because the, the individual aspirations and the organizational purpose will have to confine at one place. And that's the sweet spot. When you get that doing it, in respect of you get millennials, you get your X, Y, J, and baby boomers, doesn't matter. You will strike hard and you will do phenomenal feats. So for me, I think the, 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 the ignition for fueling this, to go away from the baggage and look at this is the purpose. The sense of purpose that will make me get up on a Monday morning and say, yes, it's a Monday, I want to work. Across. That's the level in which we need to change gears. Otherwise, there's no way with all this technology shift, you're going to be kind of paranoid with the whole things overwhelming every day. That's me, why you are where you are with taking you beyond. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, what you were saying, I was just going to suggest that we adjourn for today and we will post this on YouTube and publicize it. Thank you. Uh, thus, Suresh, thank you very much for joining us. Joining us. Today. Thanks, Suresh. Really Great nice to catch up with you. And, and uh, thank you so much. Come, come and visit anytime. And uh, next week, we're going to be looking at the edge of something new. See you then. See ya. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.